Hello, my name is Lawrence Holby of Holby Osteopaths and uh, <clears throat> I'm going to give a few uh, talks about uh, different conditions that affect the body which I hope will be of interest so um, I hope to do a whole series so this is uh, number one it's partly a trial so if you like it do like me and uh, do uh, send an email um, letting me know um, if refinements are needed because I realize that some of what I'll be talking about will be quite technical but I'm deliberately doing it so because I find that a lot of stuff that's talked about is quite superficial and actually not that helpful so I'm trying to do a sort of midway place between uh, extreme superficiality um, because those of you that are watching I have utmost faith that you will follow it and hopefully find it more interesting than the, uh, well, dare I say, superficial drivel that's sometimes seen on, uh, on the internet. Um, so this is number one. Um, this one's going to be about rotator cuff uh, muscles of the shoulder. Uh, the reason I'm starting there because I have to start somewhere and it's in my head because I've had quite a few patients this week complaining about shoulder problems and nearly all of them have been diagnosed with rotator cuff problems. Um, I usually find the accuracy of such a diagnosis about uh, 25% because it's vastly overrated that anyone who's got a pain in the shoulder has automatically either got a rotator cuff problem or a frozen shoulder. And usually clinically you find that's far from the case. So, um, Dealing, if I talk about it, it, it hopefully will start to make a bit more sense to you and give a much you know, uh, more deeper understanding of what's going on when your shoulder doesn't work and what the options are. Um, I'm certainly one option, but uh, modesty prevents me from saying that I get a 100% success rate or indeed I can treat everybody because clearly some need further investigation, some actually need surgery, and it's trying to differentiate that those that can be helped. And also, in a sense, once you understand roughly what these muscles are all about, it will make much more sense into self-help what you can do back home. Um, actually, just thinking about it, you know, what I might do is in the future give some, just a few exercises as well that can help stabilize uh, <coughs> The shoulder because that's basically what everything is about with the shoulder stabilization holding the shoulder in its socket so um, we'll start off about the uh, rotator cuff group of muscles so the first thing just to get over this sort of headache of anatomical nomenclature i.e what i'm going to talk about the only thing you have to remember, I'm going to talk about the arm bone, which is the humerus, the scapula or the shoulder blade, which is the one behind us. And then they're going to have Latin names and I don't, you don't have to worry about them, but you probably will have heard of them anyway. Um, and I, hopefully I'll pinpoint all of those things as they arise. Um, and I think the essential thing to take away is what the actual shoulder joint and when i say the shoulder joint i'm meaning mostly what i'm going to be talking about is this joint the glenohumeral joint which facilitates this great bit of movement that we've got that we can move it up sideways all over the place a very very flexible joint and it's <coughs> the actual ball of the humerus the arm bone sits in the glenoid fossa which is the end of the scapula which projects 30 degrees to the front so that add stability to that. So the way to really imagine that joint is like the ball, a golf ball on a tee. So in other words, you've got a very shallow tee, the golf ball, and it's quite unstable. That ball can fall off any moment. Were it not, and here it comes, the rotator cuff group of muscles, which help to stabilize it, and a few other stabilizers, which I'll go through. So what are the rotator gruff, <coughs> rotator guff, rotator cuff group of muscles? Essentially, there are four muscles. So we start at the top one, which is called the supraspinatus or spinatus, whichever you like to call it. 
And that muscle comes across the shoulder blade, comes over what's called the acromion, which is the bony noddle, and it sits right on top of the humerus. And as you can imagine, if muscles contract, its main function is to lift the arm up. So when people can't lift their arm up or have difficulty, there's usually a dysfunction of the supraspinatus tendon. Um, uh, and that's either very, very what's called tendinopathy or rotator cuff group injury. Um, so that's the supraspinatus. Muscles contract, so it lifts the arm up. Then below that, you've got the infraspinatus, and that is on the underside of the humerus or the arm bone. Um, then you have the teres minor sitting under that. Um, and that comes from the border of the scapula or the shoulder blade, and that lies just below the infraspinatus. And then you have the last one, the subscapularis, which lies underneath the shoulder blade, and it inserts on uh, the front of the humeral head on what's called the lesser tuberosity, it's a bubble of bone that uh, sticks out. So to remember it, not that you have to, it's the acronym of six SITS, <coughs> supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. And they all have the function of flexion, external rotation, internal rotation, abduction. Um, yeah, I think, so all the movements of the shoulder blade. And so they have the function of moving, because all muscles move bones to give you mobility, but they are also stabilizers, or they're called dynamic stabilizers. They actually move to stabilize, because remember what I said, it's, the, it's like a golf ball sitting on a tee. So you have to have something stopping it from rolling up. So it's a dynamic stabilizer. And so they're working continually to keep that glenohumeral joint, the shoulder joint together. Um, and they work together in what you can term a dynamic relationship. Um, as an example, teres minor, which is the, one of the rotator cuff groups, which we've talked about, externally rotates the shoulder. You've got subscapularis, remember that one coming underneath the shoulder blade, that rotates, internally rotates. So when you think about it, if you, they have to be in dynamic opposition to each other. So in other words, if you externally rotate the arm, you've got to have another muscle stopping you from moving it too far. Otherwise, the whole shoulder would sort of fall off, a bit like that golf ball coming off the tee. So it's like a, a, a force couple um, that have, helps to stabilize the whole shoulder uh, joint. So the four muscles come out um, and they all sort of, of the rotator cuff rib, they all come out and they sit over the top of the humeral head. And that is what's called the cuff. And they form a big group of muscles. And that's what's called the rotator cuff group of muscles. That's what everyone talks about. And that adds to the stabilization of the shoulder. Below that, um, you have a uh, part of the arm bone humerus without tendon, just below, which is called the rotator interval because there's no muscle there. But you have got what's called joint capsule and you've got a couple of ligaments, which again help to stabilize the whole joint. Then you also have another stabilizer called the biceps tendon, which is a tendon that comes up here over, and it goes over the humeral head and attaches to what's called the labrum. But we'll hear more about that in a moment. And that is, if you like, it's like a bit of rope, you know, because all tendons are quite stringy. And that stops the humeral head, the hum this part of the, uh, the shoulder, popping out of the socket. So you can see the whole, talk is really about how all these muscles come together to stay our shoulder stabilized it helps contain the whole shoulder from basically falling apart so um, we talked about all these muscles plus the biceps then and all holding the other ligaments below that and then you've got the labrum which i just mentioned which is a, a material called fibrocartilage quite a hard bit like actually um 
the ear. And what that does is quite springy stuff, firmish, and that makes the whole shoulder uh, joint much deeper. And again, adds to your stabilization. Obviously, it's not dynamic because it's not actually moving. It's fiber cartilage that helps contain the actual, <coughs> um, or makes the, the socket a bit deeper, add it so there's an other layer of stability in there. Lastly, um, because the shoulder has a, what's called a joint capsule, it's like a loose tissue covering the whole joint. It's in what's called negative pressure. In other words, um, there's always pressure that's sucking up the whole shoulder, uh, the humeral head into the socket. And that's another stabilizer. So it sucks it up basically like that. It doesn't make that noise though. And that helps add another layer of stability in there. So we talked about, you know, the bicep, you know, the biceps tendon, the negative pressure, the ligaments, um, the joint, uh, the rotator cuff group, all coming together just to keep the shoulder nice or as stable as possible. So what happens when it gets, goes wrong? So specifically, because I'm talking about rotator cuff group, the main thing that happens are tears in that. And you've, we've got sort of four groups of tears, the small tear, which is less than 25%, the medium tear, which is 25 to 50%, the large tear greater than 50% of the tendon, or a massively complete tear. And it is completely torn, very simple, because you ask a person to, you know, to raise your arm, so raise your arm, and the person goes like that. In other words, nothing happens, it's torn. And the only remedy for that, or the only treatment for that, and you have to treat quite quickly, otherwise the tendon de degrades quite quickly, is surgery. You have to have it reattached. If you don't have it reattached fairly quickly, you risk um, the tendon sort of buckling back and not being able to get a full repair in there with all the disability that can potentially ensue from that. Now, the other thing with it, um, and this is where we come to um, starting to talk a little bit about treatment. As we can see, the rotator cuff group is important for moving our shoulder about and stability. So when just one muscle goes wrong, we lose a big layer of stability. If a person, the older a person is, usually the less exercise they've had. And exercise, as I keep on harboring on, is one is a hugely important way of keeping up tone not just in muscle but tendons because you're getting compressive and extensive forces going through there and you get what are called tenocytes which are <coughs> the building blocks of tendon building up all the time so people who keep up strength exercises get far less problem with tendon problems so as you get older the tendons can degrade and they become much easier to tear i see so many people they with the famous saying all i did was move my arm like this and then get a tear hardly any force but as you get older it becomes more like tissue paper you get these small tears in there um, the less tone you have in the muscle the less good the outcome of any sort of treatment including what i do and surgery so the more tone you have the better and that's why younger people tend to do better than older uh, people but at the same time an older generation person might have looked after themselves, done you know, quite a bit of exercise, and their tone will be better than a young person. So it's not being ageist or saying that it's just old people, it's how you look after it, both young and old. But clearly, as you get older, exercise levels do naturally reduce. So, and that's why keep moving is, uh, is a good dictum to have in your life to help prevent these sort of things happening. So when it, um, goes wrong, uh, <coughs> the rotator cuff group, what I do, which I would label conservative treatment, is usually pretty effective. You know, you get, I can return 70, 80% of people to normal life within a few weeks. Um, shoulders, as I keep on telling people, as you probably heard, take longer than any other 
musculoskeletal parts on the whole for the simple reason is that these tendons and muscles are always being utilized for stability and what stability goes you have to go through that and that is why treatment is a bit more um, laborious than, than other forms of treatment which doesn't depend on this whole stability issue so um, in terms of treatment one thing that happens is that you can't move it so what treatment is what I do, certainly in terms of osteopathy or indeed acupuncture can also be very effective, is help tendons repair quicker or get other tendons to take over from tendons that aren't working properly. And you do that by what's called mobilization, moving the shoulder about, stretching it, increasing blood flow. Uh, <clears throat> and also back home, um, giving exercises for patients to do, which they can do back home to build up muscle and you can always tell if, a, if, a lucky, if you're lucky enough to have a, have a scan you can see how much what's called fatty infiltration there is into muscle um, and scans never lie so when a person says oh i do a lot of exercise and you look at a scan for example for a person um, that's got these tears uh, one of these tears you will see a whiteness in the scan whiteness you can either is water or it shows fat and it's what's called fatty infiltration into the muscle and that means the muscles degraded from inactivity and once that happens the prognosis or the amount of, of getting better reduces significantly so once you're in that state if i if i can if i see a scan i have that then you have to warn a person you've tried conservative treatment but it may not be good but the problem lies in that and it, surgery is ineffective so it's a case of managing rather than hoping to cure um, secondarily if there is huge amount of muscle wastage again any form of treatment is limited and surgery is more or less out because any surgery by definition you rely on a good uh, or good enough stability afterwards so that that can take over after surgical intervention um, and you always have this compromise of inactivity after surgery or anything like that of not doing something where the person doesn't use it that that can transcend into what's called a frozen shoulder and that is when the whole shoulder freezes so you have to like all things it's always a compromise you have to weigh up the benefits of shoulder, of shoulder surgery versus um, leaving the shoulder uh, alone with a little bit of, of movement because if you if you allow a shoulder to be immobilized for too long it will gum up and you won't be able to use it so the first port of call for any shoulder movement is conservative treatment i use manipulative treatment osteopathy to move you about acupuncture for pain relief but also there's quite a lot of evidence to show that it can actually help improve blood flow uh, tendon repair and so it's quite a good combo to use or indeed sometimes just manipulative just to get it going because any stretching stimulates tenocytes those cells that produce tendon to help repair so it's absolutely a, a good way to go however um, sometimes it doesn't work or it's not good enough or a person's in intractable pain because they, because of the inflammatory fallout people are in a lot of pain and you can hardly move them so if such, such is the case then steroids become a viable option steroids are basically a potent anti-inflammatory they don't cure everything they don't do anything to tears but that's to be borne in mind but they do subdue the body's reaction the inflammation so um, quite often you can send a person to have a steroid injection to see if that relieves it if it does then you can start working on it again it gives you an avenue of opportunity to to help it however still the steroids um, do not help long term at all. In fact, if you look at studies of steroid injections versus normal physical treatment, there is no benefit whatsoever with long term uh, with steroid use in the long term prognosis of shoulder problems. But it's absolutely a, a, a good method of reducing the pain and helping a person improve. And certainly, you know, I've seen a lot of people with shoulder problems who, are, you know, can't live a normal life they can't sleep because of pain and so definitely that is an option if 
what I do doesn't help. And you get a few people that fall into that category and you know perfectly well within a two or three weeks whether that's the case. And so what I do is I prefer them on <coughs> for um, an ultrasound scan or a, a MRI. And then if that's, ultrasound is probably better because you can then, if you see the pregnant problem, you can directly inject accurately under ultrasound guidance the actual steroid injection. So there is a condition which is called um, the a, a tendinopathy, a, 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 a rotator cuff uh, arthropathy. What happens there that the whole cuff just degenerates and what happens because that cuff is basically not working anymore the humeral head the, the arm bone migrates upwards into into the shoulder when that happens nobody can help you can mitigate pain a bit certainly with um, conservative treatment but the functionality doesn't improve and it can be quite devastating because a person has lost the use of the shoulder Surgery, unfortunately, in those cases, it doesn't work. And so the only option, therefore, with that is shoulder replacement, um, which is a whole different ballgame. We haven't got enough time to go into to that now, but it is effective. It can work quite well. It's not quite as good as shoulder or knee, but it certainly will restore functioning and get a person out of pain. So in those extreme cases, in the more elderly people who... I've lost the whole functioning of the cuff, that certainly becomes an option. If it's, the tendon is just frayed you, um, and, and it's failed conservative treatment, i.e. it doesn't work, then um, surgery involves either what's called debridement, where actually the frays of tendon that have been torn are just trimmed off and it's all, and all the debris has gotten rid of. And that's sometimes enough to help the person get to normal functionality again. Or sometimes there's a condition which is called impingement, when a person can't move their arm up enough, and that is due to what's called an osteopath. It's a bony spicule. It's a, a, a tendon that's a part of the bone, a part of the cranium, that has got excessive bones, almost like a stalagmite, tiny stalagmite sticking out. So when you raise your shoulder, it's always bouncing into that and causes swelling of the tendon. And that causes the rotator, the supraspinatus tendon particularly, to tear or become inflamed or irritated. It swells up and then it goes into that cycle. And so in those cases where, again, you can use conservative treatment can work quite well in those cases, but if it doesn't and the, the bony outgrowth is too big, then the surgical approach is to actually shave off that little bit of bone and that can be curative. So the person returns to normal functioning and it's solved. Although uh, before that, a steroid can be used, but again, as I've said, with steroid, it doesn't get rid of that sticular bone. So the sticular bone being rid of that is much more curative, but the injection can help dampen down <coughs> the inflammation. Um, the final thing to say, if it's a complete tear, then what though the only option, as I think I mentioned before, is surgery where um, a loop is put onto the bone, it's actually drilled in, and that's attached to the tendon, so it's a complete repair of the tendon which is and it's at surgery it's tested for strength to make sure it will it will keep and that basically solves the tear and the person is restored to normal function so that's a whistle stop tour of the rotator cuff i think i've yeah actually um, i don't know how long have i taken yeah, about 15 minutes i hope it you know you've enjoyed it <laughs> um if enjoyment is the right word. Um, I've gone through it at fairly fast pace, but it would give you an idea about the rotator cuff group at least, about its stability and why it goes wrong, what can be done. And usually the outcome is very optimistic. There's nearly always something can be done uh, with, without recourse to surgery or even steroids. But one has to be sensible. One has to judge when um, 
conservative treatment isn't good enough, then it does happen you know, a fair bit. And hopefully it explains why shoulders are always lengthy, because that's because of the uh, problem of uh, stability in the shoulder joint. Once it goes, you've got a problem, you've got to deal with all of that. Um, if you certainly, I'm happy you know, if you have any queries or you need more information, or indeed you have got a shoulder problem which you want to talk about, <laughs> do let me know. Um, send me an email or contact me, etc. Um, I'll put this on a blog or maybe on Facebook, and uh, if you like it, do let me know or if I need to make any changes. It is only through you will I know um, whether I'm on the right track. So uh, if you do watch this, thanks so much for watching. And um, yeah, I've quite enjoyed it. So I'll do another one in, I'll say within the next two weeks to give me a leeway. And maybe since I'm on the shoulder, we'll deal with frozen shoulder. Because that seems to be very pop popular. And what can be done, what can't be done. And it, and it is ultimately interrelated with everything that's going on in this talk. Yeah, so let's see what I can do. And uh, hope you, I'll send out a message when I, it comes out and I hope uh, you can watch it at your leisure and hope to see you soon again. Thanks for watching.